Hi, everyone. You're watching The Art of Safe Scumming. Thank you for tuning in. It's excellent to have you here, as always. And it is my opinion that whenever anybody is trying to influence you to spend or not spend your hard-earned money, that they should have the common courtesy to at least show you their face when they do it. I was going to say, look you in the eye, but I'm not really looking you in the eye. I'm looking at my camera lens right now. This is going to serve as my official review of the Shadows of Change DLC. Update 4.0. One caveat on that real quick. It is 9.46 a.m. on the East Coast of the United States on 8-29-2023, and we have an update for the build that is going to be your guys' game more than most likely. However, I do not have complete patch notes for that, and we will not get those patch notes until tomorrow, which is going to be today for you guys. If I see anything different, I will point it out when we move to gameplay as it becomes relevant. Disclaimers and background information. Yes, I believe that background information is relevant in this instance because, quite frankly, y'all don't know me very well. I'm relatively new to the verified creator circle here at the Total War community, and this is actually the first DLC that I'm going to be reviewing for uh, Total War Warhammer 3 despite having over 2,000 hours in the game, which is kind of... But if you're only following me here at The Art of Safe Coming and you don't follow my main work, then you are missing some context and perspective that most certainly influences how I approach reviewing a product like this. And I think that that's important. But, of course, disclaimers, I received a, an early access copy of Shadows of Change DLC. That's how I was able to do the content. Duh, right? But there was no monetary exchange between me and Creative Assembly. Now, my background. I'm a professional product reviewer. As in, I literally get product in from manufacturers and vendors, and I break it. And I figure out how it broke, why it broke, and how to fix it. Sometimes that's material science. Sometimes that is a design problem. Uh, sometimes it's target market implementation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And there are lots of different things that plug into that. But Shadow of, Ch of Change, I also see as a product and I broke lots of things in this product. Uh, the good news about this is that it's not a physically broken thing. I can just reload, right? So the, sped up the process quite a bit. But on any given product review, I spend about 40 to 60 hours uh, if you see my main channel stuff. But anyway, you can look that up and run that down as necessary. But you need to understand that, that that is my main job and that's what I get paid to do. And I'm very pleased to have a broad base of clients that value that service. So when I look at this whole process of reviewing my first DLC for uh, Warhammer 3, there are some things that, that definitely from that 10 years, that decade of experience, plug into this review. We're going to go right for the kisser, boys and girls. The elephant in the room, the price. Is it worth the price? Well, that's a nuanced topic. So I would say that this is an optional product, and when I think optional products, I think entertainment. Well, when we talk about entertainment, I think about entertainment in terms of cost per hour of quality entertainment. So if I say, what's the most expensive thing that I like to do on a semi-regular basis that, uh, that I classify as entertainment? And I would say, well, that's probably scuba diving. So last time we went, it was about 100 bucks a, a head to go out. It was a four-hour trip. I took my girlfriend with me, so that's times two. That's $200 for four hours of entertainment. That's roughly $50 an hour for quality entertainment. Pick another one, go out to an, a decent dinner. I'm not saying like super high-end dinner or anything like that. Go down to the steakhouse down the way, right? You're probably going to spend, if you take a date, you're probably going to spend about $50 for an hour of entertainment. So yeah, it pretty much stacks up. We're going to say that my quality entertainment is I'm willing to pay $50 an hour for. What is contained in the DLC? Three Legendary Lords. Then I'm going to spend about 15 hours on a campaign before I get bored with it. And I might play that Legendary Lord through, if it's a meh Legendary Lord, probably play it through twice. So that's 30 hours per Legendary Lord times three. That's 90. At least my public education math tells me that's 90. And that way blows out the, uh, the $50 an hour for quality entertainment. And I would classify this as quality entertainment. I would say that it definitely meets that benefit ratio that I previously defined. And what I would also say about that is, just a real quick caveat, if there's a content creator that says that they would not have purchased the DLC despite being given a, a early access, free access to the DLC, I'm going to call bullshit. I've got about 30 hours in testing the DLC, and I'm not going to give 
exact figures, but I will tell you that my hourly rate is in the three figure range, right? So if we just go with that 30 hours times three figures, um, is not worth $25 to me. Okay. So I have spent way more time than is feasibly reasonable to go and bat for a DLC that I literally lost money on. Okay. So, uh, any of that, you're just saying that cause you were giving it. No, I don't give a shit about whether Creative Assembly gave me a free copy of the DLC or not. That is what my opinion is of the DLC. Is it worth the, the money? Yeah, I would say probably. That does not mean that the value of the DLC is not up to the previous standard that has been set by Creative Assembly. I don't want to discount that at all. It clearly is lower value than what they have offered in the past. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can look at that. Are they devaluing the DLC or have they over delivered in the past and now it is normalizing a little bit? I don't know. That's up to you to make your decision on personally. I would say that, yeah, I'm going to get at least my, I'm going to get way past my money's worth back on this DLC than my uh, entertainment budget allows for, right? So, it's up to you to make that decision. And I would guide you as someone who um, tries to also help guide people, uh, particularly young men, um, that that's something that you should use in your life to determine whether something is worth the squeeze, if the juice is worth the squeeze, so to speak. So two of the factions we're going to start out with my least favorite part of the DLC, or I would say the part of the DLC that I absolutely do not like, and that is Yuan Bo. And to explain that, I first, I believe, need to expose my own biases and say that Grand Cafe, as a whole, as a faction, as a presence in Warhammer Fantasy, I believe is a mistake that Games Workshop made before I was ever born. And I am going to give... Creative Assembly a bit of a pass here because in recreating the world of Warhammer Fantasy in a Total War setting and trying to do it faithfully, I believe that inclusion of Grand Cathay is a, a requirement. Even though that I don't agree with their incorporation into the game, the concept of Grand Cathay into Warhammer at a baser level. So that's how I think about it. Now, as far as the mechanics of the game, they have gotten some improvement uh, with the 4.0 update and the new DLC. Um, as far as the harmony system is concerned, I, I thought it was pretty lame before. I think it's better now. As far as his starting position, I also find his starting position to be a little bit weird. Being over here in the southern part of Lustria, I get sort of wanting a different setting. And I think you're going to see a recurring theme on all of these legendary lords, a differing setting um, than what was expected. I still think that they probably should have packed him into Grand Cathay because Cathay sucks, okay? Uh, it's really easy to invade. It's really easy to use as a punching bag. Having another legendary lord in the area would have made the region a little bit more challenging. I mean, Village and Snitch just burn through that area with absolute disregard, even on the highest difficulty settings. So uh, for them to not include Yuan Bo in Grand Cafe, I think was a mistake because it has now spread him over here. If you want to come over here, they can put you right on the tip of the, the coastline. You can sail over here if you wanted to. I think they should have made it so that the AI had another legendary lord in Cafe because it's just, it's Cathay is too easy to roll over on. As far as the other units that are included, I find the dragons to be kind of, uh, you know, that was kind of expected. Let's find another Chinese trope and throw it into the game, right? Um, again, I just do not find Cathay to be a very fun faction to play. So that's all I'm really going to say about um, Yuan Bo, because I only spent about five hours in... Um, you and Bo playing the game. In fact, I, I really didn't like it to the point where I even deleted my save file. So we don't even have um, any progress report to look at with a uh, grand Cathay. 
Now moving on to the changeling. Now the changeling is a departure from your standard play style. And you can go watch my video on how it works uh, as far as the faction is concerned. It's a little bit strange and it takes a little bit of getting used to if you're used to playing the more traditional play style of occupying settlements. What I would say as it relates to the changeling is that this is the campaign that you picked up the DLC for because you wanted to curb stomp the AI. I would say that the greatest curb stomp, just absolutely embarrassment of the AI faction that existed before the changeling would be Ikka Claw, right? The dude's got nuclear weapons. You play that campaign not because you want to challenge. You play that campaign because you just want to destroy crap and nuke everything, right? It, you, you just you start your roll really, really easy with uh, that faction. And you start your roll with the changeling from turn one. You are essentially undefeatable. Unless you really suck, you, you, you really can't lose this campaign. You are a horde faction, but um, you cannot get your buildings destroyed. So all of your cults are permanent unless they are detected. If you run the symbiotic cult, you cannot be detected. So therefore your stuff cannot be destroyed even if the settlements are destroyed. So this is a case study in playing a cam a subversive campaign, which I think works very, very well. You basically get to design what everybody else does on the campaign map during your campaign. So if you look here, what I have done is I have set up two main factions in the old world here. I have set up relations with the vampire counts, really good relations with the vampire counts, and it's improving. And I'm in the process of doing the exact same thing with Kislev. And the reason that we're doing that is we want that settlement income to increase so that we can suck the life out of it. I find this to be very enjoyable. However, you reach a critical mass very quickly with the changeling to the point where I could see somebody who needs challenge in their Total War campaigns to get bored with this rather rapidly. We're going to cover that a little bit more here in a minute when we talk about the impacts of the DLC on the existing factions. Now on to Mother Estankia, which is another weird one. Again, we are not in a place that we thought that we should be, which I believe that she should have been put closer to Kislev, but this makes for a very interesting play style. Um, normally playing as Katarin or Castalton, uh, you don't see Dark Elves until you go up against Malice if, if he survives. Maybe a little bit earlier if uh, you're playing as Boris, but for the most part, um, you're meeting Dark Elves when you're at a higher tier. You're forced in this campaign to fight the Dark Elves very early, right off the bat, in fact, uh, with basic infantry, which is different. And you have been locked out of basically all of your high-tier stuff. All of this is not accessible until you either befriend a current Kislevite faction or you take one of the buildings that is Kislev, Prague, or Erengrad. So... Um, it makes for a much different play style, which I think is interesting uh, when it comes to uh, Kislev. And it, I would say that it works. It's just very different. And I would say that this is the most challenging campaign of the campaigns. What I would say about this is that while it is challenging, you still create a steamroll rather rapidly. I basically have taken the war all the way up to Nagaron, probably about to eliminate Nagarond with very little effort, basically fighting with an army of Kossars. So you can see here, this is one of my armies. This is another one of my armies. Uh, a third one, fourth one, right? We're doing that kind of damage to all of the Dark Elves in the region with a pretty basic army. So it's a relatively strong faction. Speaking of changes, we're going to go ahead and load up um, a Zinch campaign as Kairos so I can talk about the changes. And in the interim, I will say that I only quickly loaded up a Katarin campaign to kind of look at it. Uh, the incorporation of the new units into the existing Kislev factions, uh, I think definitely uh, fill out the roster a little bit. I think that including the Hag Witches as a recruitable capability is, is good. And the other units, I think, definitely add to 
the existing Kislev factions. But I think that the real augment for this DLC is the uh, the Zinchian add-ons. And especially in the early game when you're talking about Kairos, he starts all the way down here isolated. I did not think that it was exceptionally challenging to take out uh, Oxyadol and the campaign at the beginning if you played your campaign right. But now that you have access to Zangors very early in the game, you can now fill out your front line pretty quickly. And you can basically ignore most of these other infantry in here by recruiting the Zangors, particularly when you're going up against missile heavy factions like the High Elves. I think that that's the part that gets a little bit challenging is taking out the High Elves. Well, Zangors as a front line have shields. They have a silver shield, which soaks up 55% of the missiles incoming. So, yes, I would say that Zinch made out like a bandit when it comes to uh, this new DLC. Kairos now has borrowed time, which allows him to increase his, uh, his movement. So you basically replenish your movement. It does not take a whole lot of time for that to regenerate, especially playing as him. And same thing with Halt Army. It used to be Halt Faction. Now it's Halt Army. It is uh, a, on a shorter cooldown than the Halt Faction was. And I think that that is balanced well. So you can now select an individual army to Halt instead of the whole faction. And you get to do that every couple turns. So I think that that is a vast improvement for Kairos' faction. I think that it balances it back out quite well. So in closing, let's talk a little bit more about 4.0. Uh, I've made my case for the DLC. I, I think you guys have got that at this point in time. Uh, but 4.0, uh, there's some good changes in 4.0. I like the changes to the Kislev Oblasts um, being full settlements. I was okay with it before. Uh, I kind of got the thematic theme with it. Cool. Uh, I also like the removal of the Devotion requirements for building the buildings. Again, I was okay with it before, uh, but I understand both of those are unnecessary challenges that maybe not everybody likes. Uh, so I see kind of balancing that out a little bit. I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, they've also added a whole bunch of landmarks. Um, I like the integration of the new units and the new witches into the Kislev faction. Uh, what I don't like in the Mother Estankia faction is that um, you have boyars that lead your your armies. If you're not heading them up by a hag witch, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I thought that that should have been different. That's That, to me, seems half-assed. Um, what I would say about um, some other problems that have been uh, uncovered, there's some known issues, and you guys have seen videos out from them. I think the big one that stuck out to me was the problems with some of the settlement maps. That's unacceptable at this juncture of the game. That should be fixed. Um, Legend put out a video. I, it'll be yesterday as of the, as of the publishing of this video. Uh, where he showcased one of the broken settlements and an area that's heavily trafficked by a lot of the, the game three races. So, yeah, that's that's not good. Um, the other thing that I would say is in my Kairos campaign, I had several um, instances where cults would try to manifest and you couldn't build the buildings in the cults for whatever reason. Um, that said, they were all occupied by uh, Chaos Dwarfs. I don't know if there's a correlation there. But, yeah, villages territory up there trying to manifest cults wouldn't work. Uh, well, the cults would manifest. You couldn't build the buildings, so it's worthless, broken. As I mentioned, although I do not appreciate Cathay in general, I do like the changes to the harmony system. And um, generally, integration of the new units in the factions uh, is appropriate. Although what I would say is that for the update 4.0, uh, while we do get new characters uh, related to... Uh, 4.0. I would say that this feels kind of kind of thin, okay? Um, underwhelming is the term that I would use. And what I have to say about this and the whole process as far as the... Uh, I think that, again, this is different than I'm used to. Usually most of my communication happens over 
uh, email and things like that and phone call and stuff like that. So this is all handled over Discord, which is not a system that I use on a regular basis. So I guess from the outside looking in, from a completely different industry, if I walked into this business as a client and saw this, my immediate response would be, what the hell are you guys doing? There's a QC problem, clearly, um, with this whole thing. And I'm not a programmer, so I'm not going to even pretend to understand the nuances of that. But um, I believe that the calls of the community in general for a custodial team are more than warranted on this game. Um, this is supposed to be their flagship game. This is supposed to be the one that they're going to concentrate on for the next several years. Uh, the state of the game as is, is what I'm going to classify as um, irritating. Um, I understand the frustration of the community with things like the Croxagores breaking for over a month, right? That, that this kind of stuff should not be a problem. I should, at, at the rate that they are currently charging, because I'm going to assume that the $25 price tag for the DLC is going to continue. If they want to continue to charge that rate, then that needs to pay for the custodial team. I should open this thing up and see a hot fix every other day. I should log into my Steam and see a hot fix update that changes small things like database problems, the figuring out why just small mechanics in the game glitch out, don't work as well as they should, et cetera, et cetera. Because the game currently does not feel stable. And that's what I would say if this was any other product. It's like, guys, you gotta, you got to have people there to fix things as they arise. Because due to the complications of adding more and more content in the game, it's going to have interferences. Whenever you complicate any system, it's going to create other interferences. It's just a given in any, anything. I can only imagine how complicated it is behind the scenes as far as programming is concerned. If I'm talking to CA... Take the money that you're going to get from the DLCs and stabilize the game. There's been some missteps over the course of the last month or so that are pretty bad, and restoring the faith of your player base in this product and in your company as a whole, my advice to you as a professional that does this sort of thing for a living in other industries is that you need to give the customer what they want and the customer wants this thing to be stabilized with a custodial team. Anyway, that is what I have to say about the shadows of change DLC. We'll see if I get access to the next DLC <laughs> later on. 